<clears throat> so these are my disclosures. Um, I, I did include a dog picture. I was instructed to do that. And then this is actually from Alta in the summer, just this past summer with my family, we were here almost as beautiful in the summer as it is in the winter. So uh, learning objectives, we're gonna basically run through some trial updates from ESMO and ASCO GU. Um, I built out this deck so that it has a lot of the data, but I'm honestly gonna spend most of my time on the summary slides so that we're not up here for forever. These are obviously big podium presentations at, and so they, the presentation could go on for forever. So this is kind of the progression of, of approvals over the past um, 10 years primarily. Um, and really what we're focusing on now are these four trials, um, different disease settings, um, and different molecules kind of moving into new indications. So there, there will likely be submissions for all these. These are certainly not within the FDA label for these products, but that's what I'm gonna focus on. Um, so disease state that we'll start with first is the castration naive, non-metastatic, so they're hormone sensitive patients. Uh, the stampede did include an arm for these non-metastatic castration sensitive patients. Um, this was presented last year at ESMO. It's really for the highest risk patients. They could be de novo, had no positive disease, or at least two of the following, which are really high risk factors. So if you have someone you think is going to be positive on a PSMA scan, then they probably fit the stampede definition for high risk. Or if they were recurrent, they had a fast doubling time or an elevated PSA or had a node on imaging, then they're hormone sensitive. They're not technically metastatic if it's a pelvic node, uh, but if they have regional disease, they would fit the inclusion criteria for this study. And they did have a session, a, a period of time where they included patients who not only had ADT plus ABI, which is really the focus here, but they also did include people to triplet therapy with ABI and ENZA and ADT. Um, and, and for the analysis for this, for MFS and OS looks very similar, that basically anything added to ADT showed an improvement in MFS. When this is including with or without ENZA addition, and the final analysis really adding ENZA did not add anything to uh, abiraterone by itself, but did include uh, increase the toxicity. So MFS showed an improvement. Um, OS also did show an improvement uh, with uh, the addition of abiraterone to ADT. So this should now likely be considered a new standard of care potentially for the highest risk men with hormone sensitive disease, even if it's not metastatic. So next disease state we'll move to is the kind of the de novo or the recurrent metastatic patient who are castration sensitive. And, and obviously we've seen now doublet therapy is better than ADT monotherapy. And the next question is, is triplet therapy even better than two things? Um, there's been studies looking at that. There was a subgroup of Enzymet that did include concurrent docetaxel, and unfortunately it showed that there was no improvement in that kind of triplet therapy. It was not powered to look at that, but obviously that was very concerning to groups that had ongoing studies of triplet therapy. Um, and Aerosins was one just presented at ASCO GU uh, with darolutamide addition on top of the ADT plus docetaxel backbone. Uh, Peace One was presented last year. It's Abbey addition on top of the ADT plus docetaxel backbone. And so everything is saying adding an AR agent on top of ADT plus docetaxel is better, but we don't have an answer of adding docetaxel to ADT plus AR is any better. And unfortunately, we'll probably never run that trial. That obviously, uh, docetaxel is generic. No one's going to pay for that study to be done to show it's better to add docetaxel. But in the real world, that's really the question that we need an answer to, unfortunately. So piece one, just quickly, is the standard of care was ADT plus docetaxel when this was designed. And so they, they have four arms here, including basically abiraterone addition. And they did have arms that included also radiotherapy. These were all de novo patients. And you know, they did split it into the subgroups by, based on volume, high and low volume. We're kind of moving away from that in the modern era with new trial design, because that all stems off of charted initial definitions. As we get PSMA metrics, it doesn't make a difference if you've got five lesions or not on conventional imaging, because the PSMA is probably gonna show 30 lesions. So um, the idea of just basically worse disease is worse, and, but those are the patients that obviously do better when we intensify therapy. Uh, the OS and the overall population uh, shows that there is a benefit to using the, the triplet. And you can see if you remove radi radiation therapy, it's even a bigger delta between the two groups. If it's the high volume, it's a big delta between the two groups. And if you look at just the low volume, it's less of an, uh, an impressive difference, just like charted initial evaluations. Uh, there's just not enough events and not enough patients in that low volume group. 
So Aricin's very similar, um, docetaxel and ADT in both arms, but they were randomized and patients had darolutamide on top of it. Uh, darolutamide is only improved for non-metastatic CRPC, um, but the, pr the primary analysis here you can see is overall survival. So they put all their begs, uh, eggs in that one basket and they said, we're gonna ride for OS and they have a bunch of secondary endpoints. This was just presented and after the Enzymet showed that there was no benefit, this showed a big benefit, which was really surprising. Um, I think it's the first combination study with docetaxel that has shown an improvement in survival by adding something else in, and there's been a whole host of them that have failed. So um, this is uh, probably gonna change a lot of what we consider doing in the clinic, um, because hopefully the label will now include the potential to add darolutamide, another oral agent, up front to, for these patients. And so if, you know, they haven't reached a median on this, but I, if you draw kind of this line, and this is my kind of estimate of what the median is gonna be, we're getting out to where things are much longer with triplet therapy than they were from the very beginning. And I adapted this from, um, uh, Fazazi presented this at ESMO, it included the first four, which is down to where they included triplet with abiraterone, 61 months at the median. Uh, when you include the darolutamide, you're 63 months uh, estimate by myself, and then docetaxel enzalutamide from Enzymet um, was not significant, but that's the, the median that was estimated as you get out. So you can see that we've come a long way from charted 33 months at the median by just adding docetaxel. So um, there's certainly gonna be an idea of question of which is the right patient for this sort of therapy. It's probably not gonna be for everyone. Um, if you just put them all side by side, the, the piece was all de novo, 100%. Aricins was mostly de novo. And the OS, you can see the hazard ratios there. Um, obviously, the ones on the right, the PS1 and Aricins, were significant. The OS uh, hazard ratio for the subgroup of Enzymet was not. And a lot of these patients in the standard of care arm go on to get um, you know, subsequent therapy if they fail because they're failing earlier in the study and they have more available options. Um, it looks like adding an AR agent on top of docetaxel does not change much of the toxicity. A lot of the toxicity is driven by docetaxel. These trials have things that urologists are really scared of. If you think we're scared of prednisone, we're really scared of febrile neutropenia. Um, and so um, this is going to take a whole shift in what urology large groups, which deliver about a third of the urology care in the U.S., are capable of doing. So we're trying to figure out how to incorporate this so that the community can keep up with what is happening in GU medical oncology practices in academia. So lastly, we'll move to this first line, uh, CRPC. There are two trials that um, were just presented, uh, both with PARP inhibitor combinations. So Propel is a Laparib addition uh, with abiraterone. Um, this was an all-comer population, so they did not look at if you only had a mutation in BRCA or ATM or any of those other genes. They looked at all comers. There's a subset, 28% of the patients did have an HR mutation, um, and that was all tested after the patients were enrolled off of um, the blood uh, cell-free or uh, CT circulating tumor DNA. Um, that's not 100% accurate for capturing all the mutations, so it might actually be higher than 28%. Um, but you can see your radiographic progression-free survival or death was the primary endpoint of interest. And uh, this was a bit surprising for me with an all-comer population that uh, the RPFS, both from the investigator and the blinded independent central review, show a major difference between them. The combination therapy, it took longer until the imaging progressed. And this is addition of a PARP inhibitor on top of a already approved medication that is life prolonging. So um, the bottom though, you can see if you look at, at the difference, HR mutated patients had a bigger uh, benefit. Their hazard ratio was much better than the kind of the non-HR mutated. So a lot of this benefit for the overall population may be driven by the HR positive patients. We just don't know how to apply this in practice. Uh, obviously there's gonna be some added toxicity by adding in a PARP inhibitor on top of agents. Um, and I point out the bottom thromboembolic events, which were kind of a weird thing to see in profound. It's the only PARP inhibitor trial that has thromboembolic events. Their signals is still there in this study. It was about double the rate of thromboembolic events versus Abby alone. So the answer is still to come for what to do with a laparib for first line. Magnitude um, was another PARP inhibitor combination trial. You can see here this is niraparib in combination with uh, abiraterone. They did a, uh, a HRR uh, planned analysis um, and there was a futility analysis for all comers. So basically if you had no mutation, they analyzed there was no benefit, so they quit enrolling. But for the positive patients, uh, they did enroll and go, and go on, and there is a big hazard ratio improvement of niraparib plus abiraterone. 
They didn't report at ASCO GU a lot of the side effect profile, but they did look at quality of life, kind of a loose metric for uh, AE profile. And you can see here, all of this basically overlaps. So they're not adding a lot of toxicity from a patient perspective uh, when you add in a laparib, uh, niraparib on top of the abiraterone. So kind of for the three different buckets that we've kind of talked about today, consider ABI addition to ADT for high-risk men if they fail therapy or if they're high risk up front. Consider adding either ABI or darolutamide if you're planning on giving chemotherapy for metastatic castration sensitive disease. And then you can consider a PARP uh, inhibitor addition to abiraterone for first line MCRPC, uh, either with mutations or all comers, depending on which of those data sets you want to trust the, the most. And honestly, we have no guidance yet because the full publications really are not out for those. So we really don't have full the data. So I'd like to thank you guys and, and uh, David and Scott, obviously, for the invitation.